Association is Food Systems, Investment, Economics of, and the Economics of Scale. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time to describe what we're going to talk about because we're all going to talk about it together. And uh, I'm going to give a quick update on who we have here on our panel, and we have a wonderful panel. I'm going to list out names in the order that they're going to be presenting. Uh, uh, Greg Gerritz is a third far, uh, generation farmer. And when I mention your name, just raise your hand so everyone in the audience, great, thank you. Uh, third generation farmer, owner, operator of Elm Ridge Farm. And uh, his uh, topic of discussion is going to be socioeconomics challenges, profitability, and economies of scale. Our second presenters are going to be done on a tag team basis. Uh, first is Bob Cervilli. And the second presenter in that group will be uh, Justin Santafino. And basically, Bob is the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Local Prosperity. And Justin is the executive director of the Farmers Markets of Nova Scotia. Now, obviously, these, these people have a bio that goes about a week long. So I'm going to save us all of that. And we're just going to get to the meat and potatoes. Uh, with regards to that, uh, Bob will be discussing uh, the topic of local alternative currencies and nutrition coupons, I believe. All right, cool, cool. I couldn't read my own writing. Uh, the third presenter is going to be Linda Best, and she is the founding director of Farm Works. And Linda's uh, discussion and specific, or not specific, but general conversation will be assisting local food businesses through a community economic development investment fund. And closing with a very upbeat and lifting positive story is Miles Baldwin. And he is one of the owners and operators of the Narrows Public House in Halifax North End. Um, they run a scratch kitchen, he's got to explain to me what that means, and showcasing local seasonal ingredients. Uh, so, and Miles will be focusing on discussing small uh, financing for small businesses and alternative avenue for funding. We're going to have our uh, panelists uh, give their talk. They're going to uh, present for about 10 minutes apiece, and from there we'll go into questioning. And so, Greg, please start us off. Oh, sorry. I agreed to do this, and later they told me I wasn't allowed to uh, complain, so it could be short. <laughs> I'm a farmer, and that's the first line in my job description. Anyway, so Bob called me months ago and, and put a question to me. If you had 10 minutes, what would you talk about to help improve food security uh, in this region? And I pitched the idea back to him of... of um, improving processing and he pushed back on me and I pushed back on him but anyways that's what I'm going to talk about mostly um, so and I, I want to say at the outset here I am of a different mindset than most people here let's just put it that way um, so I'm hoping that I provoke some discussion and thought with this without offending <laughs> Um, I don't take myself seriously, so please don't take me too seriously. Um, so on our farm, we've gotten into the concept of processing because we need something for better stability in our own business uh, between climate change and everything else. It's become harder and harder um, to to make a pro you know make a profit, I guess, and be stable. Um, so there's a lot of processing that started in this. Uh, region, I guess, in the last number of years, but I, I would consider most of that micro uh, processing, and it kind of caters more to an affluent society and entertainment, I think, more than actually feeding people and improving food security. Um, um, so yeah, I see a lot of revival in uh, very small farms, um, resilient farms they are, yes, but my argument is that altogether small farms, myself included, I mean, we're bigger than most farmers here, but I still consider our farm quite small. We're only feeding a few percent of the population in this area. Um, 
you know, good that we are, good that we're talking about it, good that it has developed because it's been worse, I think. Um, but, um, you know, the volatility in the world today, I think we've all learned the last couple of years that uh, it could quite easily happen that there is an extreme food shortage. Um, you know, things are really up in the air and, and it's never been quite so front of mind, I guess, uh, that we could run out. But the problem is, if if... Unless we feed a, a large portion of the population from inside of our own area, if food gets cut off, we're still out in a few days. And it doesn't matter if we have been supporting these small, resilient farms because the food's going to get used up by the people that are here, period, and we're all out of luck. Um, so I, my argument is that we, we think too small. We need medium-sized food processing. Um, in Canada, we have micro, we have mega. Well, mega food processing is, is, is uh, you know, what's created a lot of the problem over time. I guess it's a symptom of globalization is what it is. Um, so we need to, you know, we need to rebuild, I guess, from scratch almost. Uh, and I talk from a point of view of vegetable grow growing. That's what I do. And in 30 years that I've been in the business, I've watched um, most of the processing in our area disappear. And it's because... Uh, multinationals are buying it up and they're obviously going to where they can produce it one penny cheaper because that's, you know, that's, that's just the way things go. Humans want the best bang for buck and, and somebody else mentioned here today too that average consumer isn't really concerned about the ethics behind it. They just want what they can get for themselves. And so we need to be aware of that. We're not a microcosm. We can't ever shut the borders. I don't see that happening. Um, there's not the political will for that. I mean, I've argued many times when we get into the socioeconomic thing, we're, we're too affluent to produce our own food in an ecological way because the cost of labor is so high. And that's what is, is really stressing our farm. Um, labor has come up. For, for us, by next spring, it'll be up $4 an hour over what it was in 2018. That's a 25% increase, and for my farm alone, that's $300,000 I've got to come up with next year, over and above everything else, just to break even. And quite literally, it's brought us from a very profitable to, uh, you know, breaking even. I think this year we didn't lose money, which surprised me, uh, but I guess <laughs> that makes me a real farmer. Next year will be better, as we all say. Um, so, and, and I'm not a purist. I see a lot of talk here about regenerative agriculture, biodynamics, organics, so on and so forth. And I think those are all goals that we need to work towards. But let's not forget that our affluence in this society, our health, our longevity, our well-being is very tightly tied to... Uh, fossil fuels and industrial food. Without those, we wouldn't have the society we have. And I think we take that for granted a little too much. Um, a lot of us maybe are willing to take, you know, to, to have less and then eat more ethically or, you know, sustainably, I guess. Um, but there's a very real cost to it. Um, don't kid yourself. If we stop cold turkey um, on either... Um, fossil fuels or industrial food, there's there are huge. Uh, there's going to be a huge price paid, and unfortunately, it'll be the poorer countries first. Um, but there's a re very real cost. Even we will see a, a dramatic drop in our standard of living, and uh, that will manifest in a lower life expectancy, less less enjoyment in life. Period. Um, so. I guess should we change? Should we get off fossil fuels? Should we get away from industrial agriculture? We sh we should we should work towards it. And on our farm, we have, over the last thirty years, reduced pesticide use, for example, by about ninety five percent. We're not organic. I'm too practical for that. I'm a proper Dutchman. For those who know me, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, you know it's kind of a scenario of let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's pour slowly. This is like there's a lot at stake here. Um, so, uh, in order to just have a minute a, or so, Greg. How much? Minute or two. Minute or two. Okay. Um, so, on the on the processing side, we need to be able to compete with the world because 
everything's based on lowest dollar. The, the borders are wide open. So we need to look at e economy of scale in doing that. We need to be mechanized as much as people, you know, we'd love to do it by hand. I mean, I would love to do it by hand, but the economics dictate that I can't. Uh, so we need to, you know, dig into technology. We're, we're uh, working with a, a robotic weeder on our farm, for example, to allow us to reduce herbicide. But, and then we also need to band together and form co-ops in order to process, because they have to be of a certain size to overcome regulation and that kind of thing. And another thing that I've really tried to push into the face of provincial government and anybody that'll listen, I guess, <laughs> Um, is that we need to get a handle on this regulatory thing. We need to set up a system that instead of being adversarial and punitive, it needs to be a cooperation that the, the frontline workers in that we now call, uh, what would they call them? Anyways, we call them officers that, you know, the compliance officer, that's the word. Um, they need to work with us, not against us, and they need to be held responsible to see the system go. And I think with me, we have to even as farmers and people that care about the food system, build a group of people that are very knowledgeable in this that, that can help walk people through it. And because right now I'm trying to get into processing to try to pay for my bad farming habits. Um, and uh, the, the regulatory thing is, is very, you know, had I known getting into it two years ago, I probably wouldn't have bothered. I guess it's, it's that, that hard. We've been held up two years now from regulations and, you know, over a half a million dollars tied up and so on and so forth. Um, and so knowledge would be key in that. Thank you. You've got a lot more to say, and let's hope we have some nice questions and answers to allow that opportunity, Greg. Thank you. And uh, next is, Bo is Bob or, or, or Justin. I'm going to talk about local and complementary currencies. My tagline is, if you're short on cash, just print your own. Okay? <laughs> and I want to give you a two-minute lesson on what is money. So, of course, I pull out my wallet because that's where you keep your money. And first, I'm going to start with something that we all recognize. Um, this is the Canadian $20 bill. This is called fiat currency meaning that it is just plastic, that's all it is. The only reason it's worth $20 is because 32 million Canadians agree that if you give this to somebody, then somebody else is going to accept it, and somebody else is going to accept it, and so on. So it's really a mutual confidence game. That's all fiat currencies are. If you've got more than one person that thinks something is worth something, you've got a currency. So I've got one of these wallets with these dividers in it, you know, and on the other side of the divider, I keep all the other money, okay? And so there's a lots of different kinds of money. And a lot of people have printed a lot of different kinds of money along the way. Started in the Great Depression, of course, back in the 1930s when people, nobody had cash. And so a lot of local scripts got printed as a way to just simply provide fiat uh, local economic liquidity so that people could spend money of some form to conduct, elect um, conduct economic transactions. So there's really about 12 main forms of currency. Um, Center for Local Prosperity has worked with a number of these. We're familiar with them. Um, Justin's going to talk about the nutrition coupon in a minute, uh, but there's also ones that have been developed by producers. There's one example called the carrot, and the carrot is spelled like the way the diamonds are weighed, C-A-R-A-T-S. Um, there's uh, currencies developed by restaurants and retailers. We have examples of those uh, within the province here. Chambers of Commerce have uh, printed their own money. The downtown Truro dollars is a good example. Entire communities and regions, the Tatamagush Let system is a good example. The Berkshire, which I have some examples of, um, circulates throughout most of western Massachusetts. Uh, there's entire countries. The Sw uh, Swiss have something called the Veer, which is a business-to-business alternative currency. In Sardinia, they have the Sardex, started by two guys. It's a digital currency. 
So there's some fantastic examples of what's going on around the world. I do have some handouts of two examples, the carrot that I mentioned, and another one called Baybox, which is modeled after the Berkshire, which has been one of the more successful ones. They started as a paper currency. They've now gone fully digital. So point of purchase, you scan your Berkshire card, you pay for it in local money, and then the retailer can also take that money and uh, spend it how they want with local businesses as well. Keeps money in the region, keeps the wealth in the region, and it's a great economic stimulator, and it can help with local food as well with one of these examples. At that point, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Bob. I didn't have to crack the whip. I like that. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, uh, I think complementary currencies or alternative <laughs> currencies are an incredible um, tool for regionalized investment, um, targeted investment that ensures regional economic spend or the regional multiplier effect, um, but also can be used for targeted social impact. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do with uh, complementary currencies with Farmers Markets in Nova Scotia's Nourishing Communities Food Bucks program or Nutrition Coupon program. Food Bucks just sounds way nicer than Nutrition Coupons. Uh, basically what it involves is uh, we work with the government of Nova Scotia that give us um, monies. It's actually permanently written into the budget now, fingers crossed. Um, a, a minimum investment that we attempt to um, work with other organizations to increase the total amount that we can use. And we work with our farmers markets um, and we give them an allotment of, of money based on uh, an algorithm we use, which is just how big you are, uh, how many vendors you have, and how long uh, your season is. Uh, so everybody gets the same amount per unit. Um, and then they will work with uh, one to three partner social organizations, which could be food banks, shelters, family resource centers, etc. cetera. Um, and we give the money to the markets. The markets create their own unique alternative or complementary currency. Um, and we reimburse them for those production costs. And then what happens is the partner organizations select folks because they have the, the capacity and the expertise, the relationships and the trust, uh, folks on a household level um, who might be experiencing food insecurity. Uh, and those folks receive a weekly allotment of these food bucks uh, every single week for a minimum of an entire farmer's market season length. So four to five months, all the way up to a year, depending on the location. Now, a cool thing about this is um, these are complementary currencies that have a purpose. So they're targeted aid. Um, and we have 100% redemption rate because we put um, an expiry date on these. But we also, in order to ensure that folks uh, aren't being outed, uh, by using this currency, uh, came up with a clever little solution where we just put a square reader into every single farmer's market. And so now, if you go to a farmer's market, you don't have to go to an ATM and spend three bucks. Or you don't have to stop at a bank on your way there to get your fiat currency. You just go to a volunteer in the middle of the market somewhere, and you can take out money with your credit card or your debit card. And now you have currency that looks exactly the same as the food bucks. There's no discern way to tell it apart except in the back and tiny, tiny, tiny letters would be an expiry date. And because we have an expiry date, whatever redemption doesn't happen in one year, we can recycle back in uh, to the next year. So we have 100% redemption. So now we have 33 different hyper-local currencies in distribution, and it's only being used on local products. Folks have autonomy and a say on how they'll use the product. Uh, and we, we don't tell them what to do, yet they still spend over a third of it on fruits and veg. They still spend eight, over 80% in total on food products. So it really are nutrition coupons. Uh, and uh, yeah, it can be hyper-targeted, hyper-specific. So the United Way in Halifax, for example, wanted to mobilize some Hurricane Fiona relief. We knew exactly how to mobilize that. Or if we work with an organization that says we want to work only with households that have children, we can hyper-hyper-specifically target that. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great example of, of social and economic impact through alternative currency. Thank you, Justin. Linda. I didn't make any plans before I... I love it. It's the way I fly. <laughs> and uh, there's only about uh, 
two hours and 50 minutes worth of things that I could say about <laughs> farm works, about farmers, <laughs> about processors, about all of the things that we need. But one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that every time you buy food from out of the province, that truck that's bringing it in, there's an electronic truck that's taking money out of Nova Scotia. Every time you invest in, as you, for those who are younger, um, you invest in um, an RSP, every one of those of us who has money in pension plans and so on and so forth, your money is building economies outside of Nova Scotia. A few years ago, the, the community, uh, the uh, province of Nova Scotia set up the, um, a program called the uh, Community Economic Development Investment Fund Program. And when people invest in CDF, such as FarmWorks is, you're actually getting a tax credit for uh, keeping your money in Nova Scotia and making it work in Nova Scotia. And I would argue that that's one of the most successful, when you look at all of the 100 million plus uh, uh, that's been raised through these funds, this is probably one of the more successful means that the government has had to keep money working in our economy. So FarmWorks over 11 years has raised uh, $4.6 million, but we've lend, we lend it out at, at 6%, um, and so we've actually loaned out um, $8.1 million to over 148 businesses across Nova Scotia, including two who are here on the, on the stage with me. And we hear over and over and over, we wouldn't have been able to carry out that project or we wouldn't have been able to get started without the support of FarmWorks. So we started out very small and it was about healthy farms, healthy food. Oops, we need those good chefs, those good restaurants to profile that food because one of the key things that's been missing how do, how do people learn about the quality of, and, and the lack of quantity of local food in this province? And so we've um, connected first with chefs who were making people in, in urban areas aware of the quality of, of the food that's produced by people like Greg and, and Anne and others here. Um, but we've also realized that, okay, <clears throat> <clears throat> we have this, these missing links, so if, if we're going to get uh, good food, healthy food for people in hospitals and schools, then there's those missing links. So we've helped with the, the food hub and with other processors. So we're trying to impact, following up on the 2009 uh, Food Summit when we discovered the, the challenges that, that we have, we're trying to impact across the food system. And this is not just about us lending money to people. It's about becoming friends with the people that we lend the money to, with being there for them when they need somebody to talk to, whether it's 7 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock at night. It's about going to visit them. It's about helping to market what they, what they are producing. So. We're trying to provide a full suite of services to help build the food economy. And so, as I said, I've said a couple of times today, this is about all of us working together. We can, we can all help to support people by buying from them, by promoting what they're doing, by supporting the government um, agencies that are Prenia and government itself, who are trying to help move things forward with food policy councils, with everybody who is helping to, whether through farmers markets of Nova Scotia, putting money uh, into the hands of people who really need it, whether it's people like Dave Alders who, who has put together a, uh, a food pantry. We're all part of this and, and now is the time and so Thank you to everybody when we have another offer open first part of the year. Thank you to everybody who may then consider putting a little bit of money into farm work to support the farmers indirectly. And now you'll hear how 
people have directly supported our, our, our businesses. businesses. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> and Miles. Hi, uh, my name's Miles Baldwin. I'm one of the owners of the Narrows Public House. Um, today, I'm mostly just here to mention sort of alter alternative financing for small businesses. Um, I don't have probably anything, you know, huge to say that people haven't seen before, but just going to touch on a couple avenues as a small business. It can be pretty challenging to find startup capital. So, uh, <clears throat> we went a long time. We tried to buy our property when we were also opening, which was just that much more difficult. Um, so we looked under every rock to try and find financing for our business and, uh, yeah, I was just going to mention a few of the avenues we had some success with, uh, maybe that people may not be aware with, aware of. So if there's any people who are uh, starting a business in the room or know people who are, uh, they're welcome to reach out to us and, and uh, learn from our experience as well. Um, so we, yeah, it took us almost eight years to open the doors. Uh, so it was a pretty long process. So we definitely looked high and low for financing. Uh, when you're like a server and you're a cook trying to start a business, it's you know there's not a lot of conventional avenues there for for people who want to give you money. So, uh, which is tough if you have like a dream, you got a business plan, you put a lot of work in, you have a good resume and a lot of experience and skill set to bring to the table. But uh, if you don't have the dollars already in your bank account or a big income, it's tough to get started. So, um, one more conventional avenue we went through was uh, the credit unions. So they have a small uh, loan business program that uh, is backed by the government. 90% uh, of it is sort of secured by the government. So you can go to them and they're willing to take a little more risk than a conventional bank. Um, and that program lends up to 500,000. Um, so kind of going from like the most conventional avenues we had success with to the least conventional. Uh, secondly, we went through uh, an organization called SEED and Futurepreneur, uh, SEED's the Center for Education and Economic or Entrepreneurship and Development. Um, and they uh, have a little bit less stringent lending criteria as well. They look more at your resume, uh, more at your experience and your business plan. And their sister organization is Futurepreneur, which is for like young entrepreneurs, although it's anyone under 40, so it's pretty uh, wide open there, and then uh, BDC will, if you qualify through those two organizations, BDC will come in and usually top up a little bit, so you can get up to 75000 through those organizations. And then from there, we uh, another organization we were able to work with was Farmworks, uh, which Linda is the founder of and just uh, kind of briefly touched on. Uh, Farmworks is certainly less conventional than what you'd see from a typical lender, uh, both in like the processes of how they approach the loan, like getting to know you, actually caring about who you are and uh, what your values are as a business <laughs> and what your goals are as a business. It's like very refreshing. The process to finding money can be like very draining and very disheartening. Obviously, when people you put all this effort into a business plan, an idea you think is, oh, for sure, it's going to be very successful. Look at how hard we worked over years and years and no one really cares. Uh, until you get to an organization, perhaps like a seed or like certainly like Farmworks. Um, so, and a little more of a holistic kind of organic approach. They get to know you, they come and visit you. It's like phone calls, emails, everything. So, but it's not, uh, it's not sort of a drawn out process. If you, if everything goes well, I mean, you could have a, a very quick turnaround relative to other organizations or a conventional bank. So, uh, really great things to say there. And then, uh, also, once you decide and you commit to an organization like Farmworks, there's a lot more flexibility and sort of adaptability along the way in terms of your loan relative to conventional lending. You, uh, Farmworks was able to give us a little bit of leeway on like interest versus principal payments uh, when we were struggling a little bit at the start, uh, getting open with delays, with supply chains and everything. We were sort of opening during and after uh, all the lockdowns and stuff. So. Uh, that was really helpful, which you wouldn't typically see from a conventional lender. And then after we opened, uh, Farmworks came back, or we came back to them uh, for some growth opportunity and loans there. So uh, again, they're able to like, how have you done so far? What's the success looking like? Is there, you know, are you going to be able to grow moving forward? <clears throat> and uh, gave us more support there, uh, which was inc incredibly helpful and really added to the success and the growth of our business in the first year. Um, 
so yeah, lots of positive stuff to say about fireworks. And then the last one I was going to touch on was uh, <clears throat> probably the least conventional, um, least widely known and used, although I think it's becoming more uh, widely recognized now, which is just like crowdsourcing or crowdfunding. Um, so that's basically where you go out and you uh, reach out to several individuals, usually through some kind of online platform. Uh, we use Kickstarter just because it was the most uh, widely known and utilized so far. And we, we are really concerned about the element of trust and people giving their money in advance and this organization sort of holding their money, your money, their money in trust for you uh, in the interim. So while you try and reach your goal, uh, so we did, uh, just using us as an example, and there are other platforms you can use. You can also, I know, uh, businesses that have done it just on their own through their own website because they want to try and save that little bit of that fee that you pay to a platform like that. Um, so we raised, we were able to raise just under $72,000 in, uh, just under two weeks. <clears throat> uh, with Kickstarter, your, uh, you have to reach your minimum goal, otherwise you get zero dollars. So it's like a little tricky to navigate that, uh, <laughs> but it's nice because people know that like you have to reach that goal, otherwise you're not gonna get any money, therefore you're not gonna kind of go half in to your business plan <laughs> unprepared. So it gives the, the crowd funders a little more security there. So what we did was we started with a $40,000 um, uh, target to make sure we, we were like fairly confident we could reach that target. So we were able to hit that number in, I think it was like four or five days. And then we did a stretch goal. So Kickstarter does allow for these stretch goals, which we added another 30,000, which is like a really ambitious stretch goal, but that was kind of always our intention from the start. Um, so then we were able to, yeah reach that in the, in the remaining time we had, which was, you get to choose. The nice thing about crowdfunding is like, it's so, you can tailor it so specifically to what your goals are and what your specific business concept is. Uh, it's a really nuanced platform and you can, uh, you know, your tier, it allows you to try and uh, stretch a really large umbrella over a number of different potential investors in your business. Uh, because you can do a tier from $5 all the way to, you know, 10000 or fifteen or $20,000. So, um, and all those uh, rewards can look very different for each person. So it allows you to do all that in one platform and put a lot of your energy and focus into one platform for raising money. Uh, and the nice thing about it is people, you get uh, support from the community in advance. <clears throat> so you have to do some legwork there and whatnot. But if you have a business idea that uh, you think people will really buy into and like f anything to do with food production and processing and whatnot is like very close to home obviously. So I think that would lend itself really well to a platform like crowdfunding. Um, people will have that buy-in and uh, you do that legwork ahead of time. And then when you go to launch your pro, it's only two weeks and then you could raise that much money in a really quick period of time. And then people get the added value for buying your product in advance. So like a food subscription or a food box subscription would be a good example of that. And then you get a little added value for putting your money in upfront. And for the business, there's no carrying costs. There's no interest. There's no upfront investment. Um, there's no fees like with banks. So it's just a really great way to raise money. And, uh, and then you have all these people who have already bought into your business concept uh, before you even open. And then when you do open your doors, uh, everyone's spreading the word, they're coming in, they're bringing other people. So, uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions about that for me, uh, like after this or whatever, I can. Great. Thank you, Miles. Detail. Appreciate that. Uh, at this time, we're going to open the floor up to questions. Yes, I see hand in back. Striped sweater. Hi there. Uh, my question's for Justin. So the Cape Breton Food Hub does a similar program called Share the Harvest, uh, but we're reliant on applying for funding whenever it comes up through the government. So it's not like a regular thing and then we go months without it. So I'm just wondering, does the farmer's market of Nova Scotia support food hubs as well, or is it just farmer's markets? Uh, yeah, so sorry to hear that you're stuck in that uh, nonprofit cycle that we get stuck in as well. Um, our organization is a cooperative of farmers markets, so we, we do only work directly with, with our farmers markets, but yeah, we wouldn't necessarily be able to uh, extend beyond. However, 
I'm extremely interested in conversations with groups such as yours around what it might mean to have a local currency that extends into farmers markets, food hubs, um, other nonprofits, local food businesses, independent grocers, etc. And that actually brings up something interesting that I'd, I would love to just flag super quickly because um, I don't want to hog the mic, but I was really excited when, uh, when the Premier was campaigning, uh, the Premier incumbent was campaigning back in the summer, um, they had a prototype card for Nova Scotia Loyal, um, which some of you have probably heard of. And the card was supposed to be a preloadable points card where you got 10 to 15% back of the value of your purchase on local back as something that could be loaded onto a card. But I think if the uh, economic um, justification has been made that 10 to 15% back is a savvy investment, then I would argue that 10 to 15% could be kicked back to any form of relocalization. And thus, I think that concept could be applied to a local currency. And it would be very interesting if it was a lo local currency with rules um, tied specifically to local, in which case we could work collaboratively. So I appreciate you flagging that and love to follow up. Great. Thanks, Justin. Any other questions? And since there's a lull, I would love to follow up with a point that Greg brought up, and I'd love to get his take on it. Um, with regards to processing, there was an issue that took place during the COVID event, and I, I'm losing track of the year, but I do believe it was 2020, that uh, a poultry processing facility in the Valley had a, an outbreak of COVID, so they had to close down. And because of the closing of that facility, the folks raising chickens on a commercial basis, as opposed to a backyard basis, had no place to process their chickens. And so because of that, the argument was made, well, let's distribute that burden out to the local processes, the, the, the secondary smaller processes. There was no way, in other words, that facility could process in an hour what those other pro facilities all combined could process in a day. And they didn't have the infrastructure or the manpower to do it. So it's critical. My question to you, Greg, is, is what do you see as an appropriate size and scope that would meet a need that you understand to exist? So obviously, uh, Eden Valley Farms is a mega corporation. Um, and all the other processors in the area are, I mean, they're, they're, they're doing a good thing, but they together don't add up to much, obviously. So... I guess you need to be big enough to compete on the world market because, let's face it, the dollar is king for 95% of the population. But being too big is dangerous, obviously. Um, need to be enough in each commodity in the area, I guess, so that if one goes down, the other can continue to operate. I guess it's a it's a lack of diversity is what it is, but unfortunately, regulation is, on my farm, for example, has forced me to reduce crop number of crops considerably already, and we have to drop more just to survive. We have no choice. We're being regulated out of diversity, which is a, uh, which is a law of nature. Hmm. So we need more than one, obviously. <laughs> And, and just a quick reply, uh, as far as size and capacity, if, if uh, that facility that uh, I just mentioned uh, and you just uh, followed up with, if what was their capacity, like 15,000 birds a day? Uh, and so what would that be in the way of scope? Something 50% of that, 25% of that? What are your thoughts, again, meeting the needs that you see with your farm products from a processing side? I don't know if I quite understand what you're asking. Okay, well, we can take that offline then. That's not a problem. No, no, it wasn't that. I don't know the details of that, that yeah. plant either. I just know okay. of it. Bob, do you want to? Sure. Something, uh, uh, the conversation about the Cape Breton Food Hub and um, working with Farmers Market Association. One thing, um, we'd mentioned the 10 or 15% uh, incentive. Uh, whatever, however you want to describe it. One thing that municipalities and provincial governments are just starting to tweak to is any time a dollar is spent locally, there's a two and a half times multiplier effect. 
So even if you spend 10% more, you're still getting two and a half times more in local economic activity. That's been proven by a study that we did, uh, which is on our exhibit table over there on pr local procurement, which is, of course, all goods and services, but it equally applies to food. Um, so that's something that they're really starting to appreciate is that, that multiplier effect because when uh, you spend it with a local business, that business then goes on to spend those dollars with other goods and services that they need, even if it's electrician, lawyer, plumber, whatever it might be. But if it's spent with a non-local company, the profits are going to get siphoned off to a head office somewhere that um, uh, is not local. Um, and I think I'll just tell you a, a little bit of a um, uh, kind of a framing for that type of thing. Every town in North America, every city in North America, we have them here too, there's the commercial strip that you drive down with all the big franchise names, restaurants, all the big box. They're all lined up usually on a commercial strip. It's usually outside of the downtown somewhere. And every one of those, the joke is that when you drive down that strip, you can hear the economic sucking noise because <laughs> all of that money's leaving town. So that's all I yeah. wanted to say. Great, thank you, Bob. Yes, right up here in the middle, center. So just to go back to uh, a few of the comments that you just made, Joey, um, Greg said a lot of things I didn't agree with. <laughs> but he made some really good points that I did agree with. Absolutely. And I think that you were trying, to, you were touching on that. He referenced the fact that microprocessing is not sustainable nor is mega processing, and that somewhere in the middle is this medium-sized processing, and that cooperative models are probably um, the best way to work towards achieving local food security or even food sovereignty, actually. Um, and, you know, and I think he did refer to that. So, I mean, I don't know if he's going to give us a number exactly of how, uh, what size that processing capacity should be, but I did make a note of that because, as I said, I didn't agree with much. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm only saying that because I can. Um, I, there were a lot of things I agreed with, actually. Um, but that was like that, that really struck a note for me because it's an experience that we're having similarly in um, Prince Edward Island where we're seeing a failure in our microprocessing capacity. But our, you know, the mega processing is actually off island and it puts us in a very vulnerable and precarious situation. So that sort of that identifying the need for medium-sized processing capacity, whatever number that is, uh, I think is a really relevant and important point that, that was made. Great. Um, if I can sort of just add to that from a similar perspective, which is to say what's transpired is, is the processing capacity. I think Greg, Greg did a great job is identifying the fact that it's imploded. And that's not by accident, that was done by design. And that was done by uh, merger, merger, acquisition, acquisition, consolidate at the cheapest possible place to do that. So what you see in the small processing, there was always backyard processing, didn't go through regulation, you know, there wasn't an inspector on site, but that existed. And so small was always there. What we're seeing now is the replacement of small by licensed small. And that's positive. It's licensed. So I think what Greg's advocating for is that we need to build back. In other words, one aspect of processing, whether it's small or medium, definitely mega we know doesn't work. That's the one that doesn't work for sustainability. But it's not just one method that is going to work. It's going to be having more than one size. In my humble opinion, I believe that's, that's the way to promise land and building resiliency. Yeah. On the question of how much should we have, as much as we can bloody well get. <laughs> if it was 100%, it would be perfect. Yeah. Right? So, uh, you know, if we can get to 20%, we'd be awful good, wouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think industry is always shooting for uh, capacity utilization of somewhere between 95 and 98%. <laughs> but, yeah, so for sure. Any other questions? Yes, here in the middle of Greg, I'm curious if you can elaborate on that medium size a bit more, because it's something that I've thought about a lot, that some things get a little bit easier if you're bigger. Some of the little costs of paying that consultant $250 a month to do that thing that 
is impossible is a little bit easier. But I, I don't see it necessarily happening or people having the confidence to know that's an option. And I wonder how we can support getting there. How do you, like in the governance question of co-ops, I think, are people so lost? Do we not have the right operators? Or I, I also sometimes think that we're critical of people who are at the medium scale. Like I've definitely heard people say about our business that, you know, we're too big and it's like, but we're not, we're, we're not really too big, but that's sometimes difficult as part of a community to, to, to hear. So I wonder how do we get to that next? Yeah. As another example that we have been excluded from a farmer's market because we're too big. And that's exactly how I started me and my pickup truck. Um, what was the first part of the question now? <laughs> I'm getting old. Don't pick on me. <laughs> how do we, how do we help support those to take that next okay. jump to be me? Is it, whether it be through cooperatives or or fostering that level of entrepreneurship that you know getting a a hundred thousand dollar loan or like taking those next big steps or one of the reasons can be I a payoff. Think that it doesn't happen around here is because we've been hammered into a can't do mentality um, ever since. 1867, I don't know what happened then. Centralization of power centralizes money, centralizes more power, more money. And I think too many of us have experienced too many hardships, too many losses, and we don't dare to take the chance. Um, I met a guy who was really refreshing. He's, he's a consultant. He was born and raised in South Africa. He ran food companies all over the world and in Dubai, places like that. And he was blown away with, he is blown away by how hard and how many roadblocks are involved in getting something up and going now. Because he was involved in this creation of a dehydration plant for our farm. And, and he would never have guessed in 100 years that it would have taken us three years and we're still not up and running. And so, yeah. It's, I think it, it may be harder here because of a mentality that's that's developed. Right. Uh, listening to the talk in the previous room there too around uh, like regulation and whatnot, it seems like a reoccurring theme of like uh, over regulation and overly rigid regulation that's not very intuitive and like certainly kind of lends itself more towards like larger corporations as opposed to small or medium scale production. Seems to be like a big barrier and talking to some of the food producers uh, so far just in, in the restaurant industry, they want to do more and they're like, well, I'm not going to invest more because I don't have that. Like I can either do this small scale and just try and like stay small and do my thing mm -hmm. and have support locally and, and go to these 10 restaurants or what have you or sell at the farmer's market. If you want to make that next leap, you the government's regulation is such that like you either go to the mega corporation or that's what your end goal is if you want to be successful or you're just trying to get to a point where you can sell to the mega corporation eventually or you're small. You don't have an option. Like the medium sized option is like where's the benefit there as a as a business person? Uh, you want to grow to that medium, you're gonna have to you have to jump like all the corporations, when you have like monopolies or oligopolies, you're, you're pushing, you have huge lobbying bodies that are pushing for regulation, that are pushing small butchers or small producers and processors out of the market intentionally so. So either you join us and you grow yourself really big and then we buy you out because you're successful, great, or you just stay really small and we, we quash you and we continue to take the major, majority of the market. And you see that down to like the restaurant level, like you talk about someone in the next room is talking about like country food, like try trying to sell wild game. Uh, like what about, you know, in livelihoods for indigenous people selling wild game to restaurants? Restaurants are, there's 1,700 of them in the province. You know, we're, uh, we make up like a $2 billion a year industry. Uh, there's a lot of purchasing power there and cultural shifting we can do there as well. And there's no opportunity. It's just regulated out of the market. Yeah. We had food inspectors come into our restaurant when we we're opening. It's like, it's laughable. I don't mean to be a, a jerk, but it's just like trying to tell a chef who's like extremely experienced. That's not me, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that it's like unsafe to, to like add value to your own food. No, you have to buy this processed food. Like you can't buy a whole animal from a local farmer and then process it yourself because that's unsafe. Like, yeah. okay, that makes yeah. sense. So I can serve I can serve like hundreds of people, thousands of people a week, food safely, but I can't 
I can't add value to a product in right. my own restaurant in a safe, food safe environment. Like the over regulatory uh, kind of bureaucracy in the province is what I see as like the biggest problem in a lot of these discussions. Great. Uh, thanks, Miles. So yeah, far. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, did someone want to convey something? Oh, we, we have a hand up down here. Thanks. I just wanted to share sort of maybe a good news story yeah. or something Love that's it. working. Bring it, girl. So I'm a farmer. Um, yeah, I'm a farmer, and I've been on the board of the Wolfville Farmers Market in the Valley for about nine years, and it's a pretty progressive pushing the national agenda about what farmers can do. Um, and to your question about co-ops and and what people can do, the Wolfville Farmers Market is a co-op, and the members have come together to aggregate product, to then have one store, to have one truck running to the city, um, to have a retail store, and it, that came about from the need from the farmers, because we were all running to restaurants every week, and we're all doing the same things, and we were like, you know, this, all this administrative stuff could actually be handled by the co-op, who has the power and the mm -hmm. staff and the resources to do grant writing and and the, all the things so that we can stay on the farm and farm, because that's actually what we want to do. We nice. don't want to be running chickens to the city. Nice. Um, so that's something that's working, and it's even working to the to the scale that now there's you know discussions with Acadia University about institutional buying and having and growing together. So aggregating product to get more to that medium-sized scale that none of us necessarily have to as individuals, but by pooling our carrots together, we might be able to fulfill that contract. So it's a model that is actually replicable elsewhere. Um, so there is some, some movement there, and there's some work happening with food hubs and federal inspection facilities, a kitchen, community kitchen, learning facilities. So um, there's some good news and some cool things happening down in the valley. Great. Thanks for sharing that. That is positive. We, we have a hand at the table in back there. Hi, I'm, I just also want to kind of share, we're from the Station Food Hub and we've built ourselves a federally, federally inspected um, processing facility and we do work with uh, local farmers and local produce and we're supplying all of, you've probably heard about the mashed potatoes, <laughs> to all the institutions um, in Nova Scotia and I can tell you in the past year it's close to 400,000 servings of potatoes that we're able to uh, make. It's a frozen mashed potato finished product. So that's just one example of kind of some of the volume that we're going through and we're looking to expand on other products as well as uh, just straight distribution from the farm rate to um, the institutions in Halifax as well. So again, another kind of positive uh, swing on things. Sweet, thank you so much. We have uh, a gentleman here in the center aisle, center of the room. Uh, just a thought, and not to offer any specific examples, though I'm aware of many in our province, that is in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, I just wanted to say that economies of scale are not always about size. They can be about effectiveness or efficiency. And we have tools now for communication, coordination, monitoring, food safety, transportation, ordering, payment that we did not have 20 years ago. And we need to remember that with digital tools the whole landscape has shifted. And where they come into play, as the example from the farmer's market that she mentioned, is when people get together and begin putting their thinking caps on. Mm -hmm. And whether it's through cooperation and collaboration or new ideas and innovation, there are ways that small and medium producers of food, growers of food, producers of products can succeed if they use these tools to identify even a niche market locally or internationally. And there's so many examples of this in the world right now. I've got friends who raise St. Bernard dogs, and they're, they're, they're off-grid homesteaders on a little island. Uh, they're paying the bills. Yeah. yeah. Just one tiny yeah. example. Yeah, no, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Well put, and thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Yes? Uh, <laughs> well, let, well, let's have Miles have it, and then you can pass it to Justin. Uh, I was just... It's not my 
uh, area of expertise, but in relation to the co-op, the, the chef at our place was saying like the biggest challenge for restaurants, and I don't know how big of a market restaurants make up for farmers in, in Nova Scotia, but uh, more how annoying they are to deal with or what have you. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it seems like the challenge is like a lot of restaurants choose it's it's definitely economies of scale and, and cost and price, but you can still usually make it make sense for the restaurant perspective because there's so much added value to the customer, and we need to do a better uh, job of communicating where food comes from. But in any case, it's uh, you go to like one of these people order from like a Cisco or an Armstrong or what have you because they can place they can get a massive inventory sheet, place one order, and then it all shows up. And like run in a restaurant is like there's so many moving parts, especially in the kitchen. Uh, so, so we like the, the solution there seems to be like farmers having one cooperative, uh, organization that can, uh, have the infrastructure and that standardization and, uh, even like basically centralizing it, whether in having that storage, maybe close to the city where you can get the inventory sheet that has all the local farms and then you can choose your stuff. Cause it doesn't matter if someone's out of something one week if the other farm has it, you know? So you get to choose your farm week to week based on seasonality and what they have available. But if you can actually just have one central bot, like organization that's representing all farmers as restaurants be able to do that, you'd have no reason to not carry local products. Whereas right. right now the only major inhibitor other than cost, but like we are talking, this allows more economies of scale anyways, is just convenience. And like, if you're trying to order from, 12 different independent farmers versus like Cisco, it's just so much easier. It's hard for people bogged down in restaurants to like not do that, but it's like, there's yeah. a lot Thanks of Thanks for sharing there. that, Miles. Good. Yeah. I didn't, my last one was so negative, I was trying to. Oh, good. No, that's good. I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that one of the things that FarmWorks tries very hard to do is to support the restaurants that are buying from local producers. That's that's one of the key points because it's about building that whole food system and, and making it work together. Well done. I'm going to jump in here, give the story about this summit itself and how we did the food. Okay, so we working with the chef. The chef generated the menu. We tweaked it a little bit with the chef. Quincy in the back, he's great. Um, did a stint in some of the big hotels downtown and that kind of thing. Great menu. Then we stripped it down to, okay, how much do we need for the whole thing? So we need 600 eggs. We need 50 pounds of moose. We need, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then we went out. So they would have normally just called up Cisco, ordered everything, truck shows up, boom, off they go. We said, well, no, we can't do that. So... <laughs> We had a team of volunteers, so we had to go. We had a whole laundry list of what we needed to buy, you know, and the quantities. And then we had to go out and find where, who's got it, where is it available, what's their good price. A lot of them donated the food, uh, including Greg. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, uh, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so that's how it worked, but it was labor intensive. And I can see why for a restaurant with a lot of moving parts in the kitchen, you can't do that all the time. Right. And that's why the co-ops and things like that as a piece of vital infrastructure mm. really become important. Thanks, Bob. I just wanted to do a quick little additional thing just because there's some tech folks who've been here and there's some government folks who've been here. And... I know government struggles to get their websites to look a little newer than 1999, but I know you can do tech well. And I know you can, and I'm just teasing you guys. You guys are awesome. <laughs> I think there's a tremendous opportunity to digitize um, basically SOPs and anything that might be attached to the health and safety regs of, of an individual institution. You know, it would be so cool if that was in the power or the hands of public health officers so that we could start doing things like um, folks using more than one kitchen without it becoming an issue, or storing something in a different kitchen than you produced it in, um, or just the ability for public health officers to effectively and efficiently go through something that's been digitized rather than interpreting in real time somebody's printed you know, tab system and their binder that they found. You know, there's just an excellent opportunity to make lives easier for the folks who are being regulated and the folks who are regulating. And we just have 
so many easy tools right now to do that. Um, and, and I think it would be tremendous. Also, like if you used a digitized approach, you could very easily ping just what part of your SOP requires a little bit of attention, um, but it could really just clean things up, but also just make the cooperative model that we're talking about, which will require sharing, it will require talking about more complex cold chain, um, having different products in a fridge or a freezer, which really doesn't need to be an issue if this is digitized. And I think we can do it. And I welcome uh, folks, you know, I give them the challenge to do it. So I just wanted to bring that up because um, tech was brought up. Another good point. Anyone else? Yes, gentleman here. <laughs> well, I saw his hand, but Josh, you've got the mic, so yes, and then this gentleman next. Uh, so um, just an observation and food for thought. Um, there, there is a, a couple sectors that really don't have to have this conversation because they have very good distribution, they have good processing, that everybody here that's in this room, when they grab it off the shelf, they know it's local, and that is the supply-managed uh, sectors, eggs, chicken, milk. And so I don't know where I'm going with this, but it's just an observation <laughs> that there is a system out there that works really well. You could argue that, but... It, it does, like we all drink Nova Scotia milk. We all eat Nova Scotia chickens. And for the rest of us, we're just struggling to figure out how to make money, how to get our food into it. Like there, there's no arguing about who, what, what the government or the hospitals drink. They drink Nova Scotia milk every time. So that's just my yeah, no. observation, thoughts. Good point. And I, I could respond to that. Yes, it's Nova Scotia milk, but Joe, at the very outset, you mentioned aggregation, 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 which is, of course, what happened in the dairy industry. Mm -hmm. So, again, I invoke the economic sucking noise. You, all of that profit from all of that dairy heads to Quebec. Yeah. It goes there and comes back, does it not? The milk? I don't know. I think, it, 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 is that not correct, or do I misunderstand that? Okay, it's owned there. So Agri-Core yeah, here it's, it's does... It's owned there. Okay. Maybe, maybe okay. the Nova Scotia government could come up with an export yeah. tax. Yeah, that's right. For all that's right. the wealth. Yeah. That's, go, that's going up. This gentleman here with the uh, black vest. Or... Hey. So uh, my name is Matthew Winchester. I founded the company named Food Bite. I think Greg knows uh, a little bit about what we do. So to Justin's comment about um, having a digital service that handles SOPs, that's literally what we created. Um, it's, it was a great proof of concept. It's still going great as a company. Um, the only uh, issue that I'd have to levy against your comments is it is incapable of solving people problems. So <laughs> as much, like, it definitely solves the information problem of like digitizing the SOP, reporting, uh, monitoring, tracking all of that information. At the end of the day, when you have someone from the CFIA say, that's a computer and I'm scared of it, that's not actually going to solve the problem. Like we've, we had situations where we had to hire a consultant to basically sit in front of a laptop. And when somebody said, what does this mean? The consultant would push a button and then look at it and then read it off to the CFIA officer. Because at the end of the day, they're not trained on it, right? Their union doesn't train them on how to use a specific third-party software. They won't recognize it because it's private, right? So, so in those kind of situations, um, what would you consider to be an ample prop, like an ample solution to the uh, people problem? Because I haven't figured it out. I want to add something to it. Um, it's always. As, as a farmer, I, I feel like it's always social values are downloaded onto us and we got to pull the line and pay for it, be responsible for it. So we have food safety, environmental safety, human decency, all things we can argue for. But we get to pay the bill and we don't get to recoup the cost. So it, when it comes to regulation and laying out a way to do it and maybe coming up with technology that makes it easy. My humble opinion is that the bloody government should be paying for that, not the producer. 
They should be paying you to develop a program that is supplied to us because we are producing food to the standard they want. Then we can compete. The ALUS program in Ontario um, used to pay $37 an acre. I'm not sure what it is now for, for people to maintain wetlands and so on and so forth. And my argument forever has been that um, we need to pay the farmer. We, as I said last night, we, we need to make, the, make sure that the farmer eats because we have been enjoying the fruits of their labors uh, to a lesser extent than we could have when 50% of the calories, and as I say this, I'm looking at that map on one of our slides. It shows the, the, the consolidation of businesses. 50% of our calories across uh, Canada are highly processed food. And yes, we have some good highly processed food here, but essentially, if we're going to fix health, we've got to fix food. And if we're going to decrease the percentage of our, our budget that goes for health repair, it needs to go to the farmers. We need some of that money to be supporting the farmers. I am not pleased when I hear that farmers do as they've always done and uh, donate to all of these organizations that desperately need food. I'm very pleased for the people on the receiving end, but knowing that in many cases, and I've heard this far too many times from farmers of all sizes, they would like to be able to go home at the end of the year with the, with the equivalent of minimum wage. And when Philip mentioned uh, U.S. farmers last night at 13.5%, the last five years in, in Nova Scotia, the, bulk of, the, the, the gross net income of farmers has been underwater. Mm -hmm. And that cannot continue. That's why I do what I do. That's why the other people involved with farm work do what we do and support the farmers and, the, and all of the people through the system who are trying to help put the right piece of money and, and, uh, and conversation and so on and so forth in the right place at the right time. Because as I've said, this is an inflection point. We, that we are at, at at this point, I think, with all of the things that are happening globally. But we've got the people, we've got these guys and 140 others who are working on the food system just in farm works, let alone all of the other people in the system across um, Nova Scotia. Let's figure out how to support them. Let's do it better. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Any other questions? It's a good discussion going on. Yes, Maria. So we're food producers and processors on our farm. Um, and we have a high quantity of people wanting to have their poultry processed on our farm um, to the point that we have to turn people away during the year because uh, we've got a lot of other things going on. But we have that infrastructure that's in place. We do free range production, so we're not processing outside of the growing season because we aren't processing our own chickens. But um, there's an opportunity there for other people who are growing food in a different way to use that infrastructure. And in a topic table I was repertorying for earlier, um, we, people were talking about how there's infrastructure for other types of processing that is here in the province that nobody's using. And I think that's a really big opportunity cost. And I think we need a better way of connecting producers and people who want to start processing uh, to places where that infrastructure is there and it's not being used. Create a little bit of a clearinghouse to connect the need to the capability and capacity. That's a great point. That's a great point. Anyone from the department in the room taking a note? If anybody wants to anybody wants to buy a chicken avatar in Yarmouth, <laughs> I've got one for sale. <laughs> we, we have a hand up here in the front round tables to the east of the room. Hi, I just... Is it on? Am I on? No. 
There we go. Uh, I just wanted to uh, add to, the, to those comments that were just made. Um, I mentioned when I was speaking uh, yesterday uh, with respect to some of the work that Food and Beverage Atlantic is doing is creating a, a digital ecosystem that is um, one of the ambitions behind that is, is to start to be able to, to make people aware of who's doing what and how to make those connections. Um, so by all means, um, reach out to me and I'll, I'll be able to help with that in the future. Great, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Folks oh, getting tired, thirsty, need a bathroom break? We've kept you hostage for a long time. <laughs> I think we've overrun our time limit. Yeah. Well, I'd like to give the entire panel a wonderful round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.